So today we're probably um, we're trying to do a number of topics. If I look at the, the age and, and demographic, everyone's pretty much in that. Hey, we're thinking about retirement. We've got our toes into retirement. Some are. Some I know are very excited by the thought of retirement, some are terrified by the thought of retirement and everything in between. So, so as a firm here, we've really sort of ended up specialising uh, in this area. So you know, you've got Belinda here today between her team, my team and Nikki, that's pretty much what we deal with day in, day out. Um, the, the great retirement or the great retirement you'll read about, it's absolutely happening. We are having more people bringing retirements forward in the past 12 months than in 20 odd years of me doing this. Um, we did a, a cash flow for one, it's a thing of beauty, a one, three, five year spreadsheet beautifully. They pretty much went home and came, we're done, sold the house, put a van, their photos are here, they're off, they're gone. Um, so as soon as they knew they had enough, they were, they were heading on their way. So there, there is a feeling of unsettling coming out of COVID. So if you're, if you're feeling a little bit of that, it's probably understandable. And I have some props. So we used to give these things out. Does anyone know what this thing even is anymore? <laughs> it's a bag tag. We used to get excited by retirement, get eye masks, and we started doing that. This is what 2020, 20, 2021, 20, and 2022 is. You get a face mask. <laughs> <laughs> and the worst bit is it's true. Um, that's the harsh reality of where we are. But people are talking travelling in. So those that are down the track from you that are retiring and come in each six months and see us, they're talking about the end of the year. So the, the predominant thing here, the end of the year, the end of the year. They're ready to go yet? Not yet. So Paul, the other partner of the firm, he's been to Canada right back today. So he was the guinea pig for a lot of people. So he's going to have to write, hey, what was it like? You know, people overseas still like Aussies. How did you get there? What was the testing and all that? Because that was something he booked eight, nine months ago and got to go. I tried four times in New Zealand. I was four for zip last year. Um, so it's someone else's turn to lead the way because I'll, I'll go and climb Mount Kosciuszko at Easter and go to Falls Creek and stick to Australia for a little bit. Um, but we need people to get out there and, and start travelling and doing things and it is starting to happen. Um, so I don't want to be too confronting but what if there's no weekends, just days? Um, because a lot of you are used to that, oh, I came Monday to Friday, what do we do on Saturday in my world? And, and Belinda's is probably one of the kids got organised. I would love to drive them all over the Gold Coast for their social life, that's my weekends. Um, but as kids are finished, then we get to a point, weekends might be golf, there might be other things we like to do. When we start talking retirement, what are we going to do for seven days? And there's some, I'll play golf, great, can't play seven days a week. Um, there's lots of things people tend to do, but you actually need to have a, some, some way to, to really understand that your life, lifestyle is going to change and what you're doing is going to change. And none, we haven't got lots of figures here today because we can do those. The biggest part people have trouble with is all the, the touchy-feely side of, of what we're actually going to run through today, and that is, well, what are you going to do? Because we get to see retirements every day, and we see what works and we see what doesn't work. And I can tell you by the biggest one that doesn't work is if you are fed up with work and you hate doing that and you have not given a thought to what that looks like, meaning the rest of what I'm going to do, they're the worst retirements. They take a, a really long period of time for people to transition, and when they come in, what's their words after a year or two? It's like, oh, I can't believe I had enough time to work. That's like, tick, you're there. You've now got a lifestyle that's sustainable, hopefully happy, and those clients tend to be happier. They tend to probably live longer because they've actually got some purpose to look forward to. So, sort of, don't underestimate the power of, uh, of that. And if you try something and it doesn't work, it's okay. We've climbed pickleball's been the one. I knew nothing about pickleball. We've got lots of ladies that take up pickleball. And that was because they played tennis. Tennis was a bit hard on the body, and now pickleball's a thing on a half size tennis court. So um, there's all sorts of new things popping up all the time. So we've got little notepads in there with any notes, but they, these are the main things that people need to look at. And we get asked all the time. So, because if you're sitting here going, well, I'm thinking this, I can tell you we've got slides at the end where I was going to get one retiree to come and talk to you. It's like, here's one we prepared earlier. 
what I did was send out about 40 retirees and you've actually got the answers in there for summary of that. So you'll see there's some common themes of what people are thinking and then, oh, actually I'm probably thinking that too. So there's a lot of commonality. So where am I going to live at an each table of thought? What will I do uh, out there? And it's day to day. Um, I'll run through a bit more of that detail. Travel's the answer. I'm going to travel. Where are you going to travel? Because at the moment, it's pretty hard to go overseas. So are we going to travel domestically? And how long are we going to travel for? Because you can plan a trip and go away for two weeks and you get back and then what? Oh, hang on, what do I do now? So, so we, we need to sort of look at that in a bit more detail. The big one there is will I run out of money? Uh, that is a uh, constant theme. And that is irrespective of what happens with property, what happens with poop, and what happens to the next nutball, because there seems to be one always coming around the corner, unfortunately. And how do we get through those situations? Uh, intergenerational wealth and estate planning. By chance, we happen to have a lawyer in the room. He is my lawyer as well. So he volunteered himself to actually answer a couple of points that I was going to, and I saw his name a minute ago, and I went, well, rather than me giving you the answer, we'll have a trained professional's answer, because that's pretty much what I'd send you to go and sort this. Uh, if that. And first-hand experience from some of those. So we'll run through that. So we've got four offices, a um, couple on the coast, Sunshine Coast and Sydney. So all independently owned <coughs> planning offices. The plan in Sydney is you buy the house for four million, you pay interest for ever and a day, you never pay the home off, it hopefully goes up in value, and when they retire, they sell the home, they pay the debt back, and what's left is they retire with. Now, if you had told someone in Brisbane and the coast that three, four years ago, they'd go, what? We, we don't do that, we're Australian. You get in, you pay your house off and you save and then you, that's the model. So it was interesting for us to actually talk to the guys in Sydney, what they're talking to their clients about. And that, that's a total different way of thinking of having the, the home and the debt, carrying that, hoping property's gone up. It's worked really well the last several years. Will that work in an interest rate increasing environment? That will be the real test. So that's, there'll be lots of people that have that strategy or approach. Um, Where do they live? Tested in Sydney. Yeah, like if they sell their house for a profit. Or you know, it used to be able to, your kids could afford to buy the year, and they can't. Yeah. That's because they're coming from different places. So we, we're noticing the number of new clients moving to the coast. They, they're not retiring in Sydney. They're oh. not retiring in that. They don't want to go to the western suburbs. They've probably been brought up in one of the beachy ones. Uh, but if you look at, we advertise in Ocean Shores, there are lots of clients in Ocean Shores. Uh, for a million dollars, you get a bigger house, well, it's probably more now. Um, there, they've got the golf club, they go, wow, this is just incredible. Yeah. Um, so they, they are relocating and moving to do that. So they, you know, we've, you've just noticed property prices, you know, we know some of the Coloshes and Hendersons are the ones that sell a lot of the big properties around here. And, and invariably there is lots of interstate people coming and that's what pushed prices up. Something that, you know, sold on Narco Street for 3.18 months ago, someone paid five because they don't care if it was only worth 3.1, they want it's cheap. There's two people want it, I want it, I'll just pay whatever. It is. It, it's really changed a lot of that supply demand dynamics in a lot of communities. And that, that's going to cause issues down the track because um, everyone feels good when your house is worth a lot of money, but if everyone's got debt and they can't downscale and they can't sell, then, then we have other issues. So, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, baby boomers, they're actually staying in their home, so I'm uh, going to Bernard Salts and uh, Prezzo tomorrow, Brisbane, taking a couple of staff, because I saw it a few weeks ago. They said, yeah, so remember that big statistic we saw, and we're going to sell the family home, and then the next generation, Gen Xs, are going to come through and buy the homes, because all of the baby boomers are selling, and that's going to solve all of our housing issues. It's not happening. And for two reasons. One, the house is worth lots of money, and they think it's going to keep going up, and we'll just keep doing that. And the second one is the baby boomers are probably raising the grandkids and they've got the kids and the grandkids and everyone there and go, oh my God, how do I downscale the home? Oh, this thing's full. Um, so there's been a change from, you know, when I went to seminars 10 years ago, it was, yeah, you've got the big home, you sell it, you downscale. That's not actually happening. Um, but there is the biggest wave coming through of retirees at the moment, the baby boomers there. Um, so yeah, they're finding their own method and they're not following their predecessors in there. Uh, travel, and then where do we go? What do I do when I go away? So that, 
that can be a really big issue for people at pre-2020, <laughs> when they used to travel a lot. I've got the home, how do I lock it up? How do I not save? How is it secure? I'm like Peter and I've got 10,000 pets, or he minds my budgies, thankfully. Um, what do you do with all those things? You know, we go talk to clients here, yeah, I'm gonna travel, do all this, and there's one, they're not in the room so I can pick on them. I turn up to the meeting, yeah, we've got the man, got everything, there's a goddamn puppy. <laughs> I'm like, seriously, we, we've now got a puppy. This is like having a baby and we're gonna go and travel around Australia. Do you realize how much harder you've just made so many things that were gonna be so easy? Um, life stage, you want the puppy, go and do your travel, come back eight months later, buy the dog, everything's easy. Oh, we found this place as they come back. Troy, there's all these parks didn't like dogs. And then we wanted to go somewhere and we had to ask someone in the caravan park to mind the dog. It's like, all right, there's a few little learnings here when we tell people these things. It's like, if you want to do it, knock yourself out. But you can make life a bit easier just, just by recognising there's time uh, for different scenarios and things there. Um, so staying in the home, look, I'm a big fan, and I know Belinda is a firm, we are in blue chip property. Buy the best house you can, stay in it. Um, if you get to a point it is too big or you want to downscale and, and uh, free up some capital, that's a great thing to do. But other than that, staying in your house generally works well. Because you're probably in an area that's built up, it's more established, it's been there longer, it does tend to grow better. Yes, there's costs. All right, we might have to pay the lawn man. I think I'm the only man in Broadbeach Water still mows his own lawn out there because I can't bring himself to it. That's, I have to go looking for exercise. So. But if you look at that, that makes sense to actually, if you looked at the cost of the lawn man and the pool man, uh, they may obviously look at them on weekends um, sometimes, but those costs in the big scheme of things to keep in your house are probably not that high. But it's a mindset, I, I've never paid for that, I haven't, I haven't had to do that. And that generation tends to be very proud as well. It's, it's hard to ask for help. Um, one of them, their clients of ours, now and they had a horrible situation because they didn't want to ask me as the neighbour or anyone we've sorted that. I know he's lawn every time. You don't have to do that, Troy. It takes me 10 minutes. I'm like, mate, it's 10 minutes more exercise. It's less walking my wife takes me to do. So um, for, from my thing, it's, it's really easy to help out in those scenarios, but he would never ask. So it's just getting around that mindset. And if I've got a lovely neighbour next door that's really quiet, I'm really happy. Um, so there's a win-winner for everyone out there. So. Unit living. Biggest complaint for units, Belinda? The neighbours. The neighbours, the body corp. I walk out the door, someone's there every second. Really some like people are looking second. at out, Al's going, I'm okay with that. And some people, some people can do that and embrace it, but if you're used to a house, and in particular, I always say it to with a waterfront house, because if you look out there, what do we see? Water, where's the nearest neighbour? probably couldn't really see what they're doing. Picture walking out this door and having a neighbour on your floor that heard a door for a chat and then someone down the other end and then down on the left. And then we've got Johnny on the body corp who was ex-tax office employee, we'll pick on them because no one likes them, who just wants to just be annoying. The amount of grief or people we see selling in retirement, moving buildings and things like that is quite staggering. Um, the other one, if you go that way and you went to Mermaid Beach, um, up there, um, what happens with high rises? Or Main Beach, sorry, not Mermaid Beach, I'm sitting there. What happens with high rises? They're tall, they've got views. What happens next door? You can build your house. Yeah, so you paid three million for the view, it was fantastic. There's no real estate in the room. They'll tell you to sell your property. Yeah, house. 90 year old, she'll never sell it. Intergenerational, never get sold. Or peace with CDs all the time. Next thing you know, the next you know, 80 story tower is ooh, it's there. Um, so, their, their thing is just to consider with, with unit living, it looks good, you get really glossy brochures, they spend lots of money on marketing. Just be careful what you see there today, what can be built around you, because that's. Nothing worse when you're when you're in a great routine retirement and it gets thrown out by that. And I've got one lady at the moment that's that's like a three and a half four million dollar unit that's views about to be destroyed. Um, it's not worth a three or four million dollar unit when that happens. So it can also be a very expensive exercise. So 
just bear that in mind when we're thinking of downscaling. Town townhouses. Least favourite model than the than the unit. So I had a client, had a lovely house, knocked it down, built a townhouse, I put someone next door. Next door break and sell it to the 82 year old who's deaf, loves playing the piano all hours of the day and night. Oh my god, what are we doing now? There's nothing you can do. She's allowed to use her unit, she's got no idea, she's bugging someone. Eventually she moves out, and then we have the 20 year olds moved in. There's another them in the room, so we can pick on them. Um, <laughs> who are just being 20 year olds, but that's annoying on a Tuesday night at 10 o'clock. Then he, uh, I, w I won't pick on someone falling off a ladder because you told me that story today. But he fell off a ladder. And what do townhouses have? Stairs. <coughs> so the amount of times we see clients sell their 20, 30 year old home for the shiny new townhouse that has all of the bells and whistles, but it doesn't fit the one key criteria is, hey, if I'm buying this for the next 10 years, don't want to go up and stairs. I don't live in a double story house because I didn't want stairs, but I went and bought the townhouse because it was cheaper, I freed up some capital. And it's all really new and it's cool stuff, Troy. And you know, I can just picture the clients' faces who bought these and then sold them a year or two later. And some of those went to units, and thankfully they did listen to the conversation about units. So a lot of those I bought where there's only one or two per floor. Smaller complex, great, I get out my door, I don't talk to anyone. If I want to, I can, fantastic, works really well. The other one for people downscaling on a bigger house block to a smaller house block, and particularly waterfronts and things if you used to view, is when you're used to looking at that, and now you're looking at that, and you're at home all day, that really gets frustrating. So just bear in mind those thoughts when we're, because it looks good on paper to downscale. Um, and then the other issue is the, the off the plan and those things, and when those have read the paper with, uh, Tom Dev and, and issues on the coast, you just, you just got to be wary of those things. So when people are going to buy those, we send them to Peter to go and read contracts, which I know you're never a fan of, because I think I think even one of our staff who read and found 64 different issues in the contract that oh, no one else had, had found an issue with them. Um, but actually, she's still there and happy, and she got 64 of the things fixed, because so, um, it was cheaper for them to do that to one and solve the problem. So. And, uh, I want to join the grey nomad. So these clients I was talking about, um, they just live around the corner from me. They build a purpose-built single-storey house in Broad Beach Waters without a pool. Like, oh, we used to be the only house years ago without a pool, but now mine was because I didn't want one. I have one that no one swims in now. It's an absolute pain because everyone in Broad Beach Waters has a pool. You tick the box, it's been there 16 years. What used to be uh, a nice house is now a very old small house with what's gone on around. They purpose built this for their retirement. Had uh, probably heard my complainings over all these things over the years. My great single story did all that. Uh, they got an absolute bomb for it the other day when they sold it because a retiree walked in and went, There's my house. Single story, I got an outlook, I can lock it up and I can go away. And even the agents were like, oh, How do they get that for a single story? I said, Because everything's new, everything is done exactly for a retiree to walk in there and walk out the door and go away lock it up so um, people will pay for that you know that lifestyle and so there, there is a niche market for that um, out there but you've also got to want to go away so the grey nomads I think Belinda was sitting in the room with one so so, we, so you you can so there's a common theme with something I'm gonna buy the motorhome so I didn't have that in there but I've got an outer waffle so the, the motorhome versus the I'm in so many grands with the motorhome yeah, motorhomes are expensive. So my parents have always had caravans, gone all over Australia many, many years, bought a motorhome, lasted six months. Because when you pull up in the town, they used to, mum sets the van, dad jumps in there, goes and grabs milk, which is code for carton of beer and bottle of wine for Mal and milk and, and bread. The motorhome, you pull in, you pull up, oh, hang on, I can't get there. Next thing you know, dad says, oh, look what I bought online. My dad bought an e-bike. Great, so now my 79 year old dad has a backpack riding an e-bike to go and get the beer and the thing we pull up and I'm going, oh, this is just going to go really well. Thankfully, before he fell off and hurt himself, um, he got sick of the fact that when you turn up, your whole house is there and you couldn't go and do anything. 
So, yeah, but we had a lady in yesterday who loves motorhoming um, and they're used to it. So it's just understanding that's a different scenario depending which way we want to go. And you've got to want to go away to be that great. And maybe try to think by. <laughs> that would be good. We have had some higher than, um, to do it. And people have to want to do that. But so these clients, they've had it off. And for them, I know it will stick. They'll be away for probably a year or two. We've had others came back after six months, came back. Yeah, we're back. Yep, done. What? Done. Yep, seen it all. We're going back to work. That's code for didn't work well. Okay? <laughs> Because we didn't address any of those ideas or thoughts, we just hated work, we sold the thing, we bought a motorhome, we torched 170 grand, we just went off and realised probably they were running away from something, not towards something. And the photos out here and the reason why the dream board's so important to us as a firm is they're the retirements, you look back there, they're the retirements and things that are working well. Because the clients are sitting there, those clients that sold the home headed off Two days later, sent a photo and it's out there of them sitting there with a beer and a kangaroo and went, how good's this? And you go, they're going towards something. That's, that's someone who's on a positive path. So, um, and, and not everyone's retirement's the same. So that's one thing you, you will find out. Or like slide two, how long does it take? 20 minutes. Um, so what are you going to do? So. No longer have a weekend, so that, that's the, the starting point there. So a lifetime of that, there's a couple of ways to, to go into it. Now we do talk to people about you know, transition retirement. It's got nothing to do with tax and drawing some money out of your super. Do you want me to go that way? Because mm -hmm. um, we did have people who asked if we filmed my extend my elected. Uh, so if you actually went from five days a week to three days a week, or two days a week, well, what if we just made enough money to cover our cost of living? You'd feel a lot more relaxed and comfortable heading into retirement with that approach, as opposed to the day you get your last paycheck. And business clients are probably used to it a little bit because they might scale back over time. But for an employee, come Thursday, fortnight, money doesn't go in. It's going to be a really uncomfortable feeling there. So, what will happen when this sort of changes? So, so what are we going to do? So golf, love golf, can't do it every day. So we do, we look after a golf club for, um, uh, on one of their investment committees. There's clubs and committees and golf clubs and I can see why people get on and fills in time. It doesn't look like a fun method to fill in time myself. Um, but there are interests and things like that where you, you might have had time, it might be an interest, you might actually want to take on in regards to that. Uh, joins with committees and when you have ideas you end up heading them up. So I'm head of St Hilda's Father's Club for the last two years and two more. Uh, lucky me. Um, <laughs> but, but you've got to have something. Mine's to give back. I want my daughters to know that I'm happy to go donate time, give back. And my, my passion is to get dads to support their daughters. They turn up to TSS and other events and watch that. Their daughters are playing tennis and whatever and they don't show. I call them. <coughs> so that's my... Mine and Luke, Mr. Henderson, the two of us, that's our, our little thing we like to do to, uh, to get, get that involvement going out there. So it's having something like that to, to find an interest. Um, volunteering does work as well. We have a lot of clients who do volunteering. I've got some notes later that to remind me about how that works for mature age allowance, because I did a little note for that. So there's the reason to do it for assembling to get some money, and there's others just to feel good. Um, so, one of the clients we helped together, he I played, well, I tried to play golf four times and it got rained out the last four months. Uh, but yeah, he volunteers one or two days a week because he went, well, I'm sort of working two or three days, I'm not ready to do nothing, and I'll, I'll just enjoy it. So, so there's different methods of how do we do that. How do we change the routine and affect the relationship? So if you've been somewhere where hubby goes to work and wife's at home, so my wife tells her, oh, true, I'll never retire, we'd end up divorced. Everyone thinks that's sad and a horrible thing to say. I don't like to sit still, I don't sit and read books. If I'm reading something, it's probably statistics and analytics, and then I might go and prove it and look at it. I find it relaxing. Um, others will sit and I'll read a book on a Sunday. Um, my wife and I, we go for a 12k walk. That's, that's our idea of sitting still. Um, but it does make a big change. So I watch my dad go through it. Um, it's probably 18, 20 years ago, so he was a sparky 
worked like a lot of, a lot of blokes do, around the clock providing for the family, went cold turkey. He sat there depressed watching midday movies, um, a bit longer than that, and still, still doing some uni study and that, and, and going, what the hell are you sitting there doing this for? You could just see that. And it took two or three years until he actually got a new routine. Um, and then he ended up um, restoring cars with, with a friend for a few, few years, and then he found other interests in car clubs, and then now they're too busy to do it in. Um, so you, you really want to sort of understand that is something that's out there and just don't downplay the, the importance of that. Australia versus overseas travel. So um, I'm sure nobody here has had that uncomfortable situation to play in a room. But yeah, we're going to travel great and um, with a couple of room. And he's like, yeah, can't wait to be a grown name. I'm going to chase the white line. Looking forward to it. <clears throat> My mates are done. I'm ready to go. She turned around and went, what do you mean? We're going overseas. I have no interest in a caravan. I sort of thought all of the build-up to retirement, they might have had that chat. The answer was they have never had that chat. They have had all of these conversations around travel, but none of it was what the travel was. Yes, we're going to travel. He had his mind, she had hers. They thought it was together. And um, they came to a couple of a happy ending story. But it, was, but it really identified, you know, you, you do need to have a bit more of a an understanding of what travel is and what it looks like. So, you know, my house, my wife loves to hike. We're going to hike Mount Kosciuszko, because I said, no, if we're going to go for a hike with the girls who are in grade eight and 11, I can only drag them for another year or so and then they'll refuse. Let's do the biggest mountain in Australia because we've done to Canada and done that. I'd rather go ski, so July will go ski. So you've got to have methods of doing things you want to do and fitting those in and having a well-rounded scenario there. Funny enough, not all of our friends wanted to come hiking with us though. But, um, the brother-in-law, they're coming, sister-in-law, so. The trouble is he's in the army and fit, he'll just run up there with me going, I'm coming, mate. So, um, but yeah, it's having that conversation, what do we want to do and when do we want to do things? So uh, here we are getting cruising back for, um, in a, a month or so. So we went on our first cruise as a family just before COVID, because my wife and I went the boat five days. That could be my worst nightmare. But literally, my wife was running laps to the deck. And they went, oh, we'll just go and get our 10 Ks in, then I'll sit down and have a beer. The other family went, with no issue at all. They were, they'll be at the buffet, he'll be at the bar. And, and that was their thing, they really liked it. We actually didn't mind it then, because there is actually lots of things on. There's shows at night and everything. Um, and then we couldn't go again. So, but it's, it's having those different different ideas and different things to try. And, and from a retirement perspective, now one of our clients is the El Camino. Is that how? Oh yes, El Camino. Yeah. Okay. That he walked. Now he managed in his seventies what his forty-year-old son couldn't finish. Um, but my point being, don't put those things off until your seventies. If there's things you want to go to the the physical and all that, get yourself in shape. You know, come tick those really big bucket list items off because you know we never know we're going to fall on a fence and hurt ourselves and do other things. So, and they can. Um, I'm just picking up on that. Because life can change. And you know, I was laughing, telling the story with Brooke. I went down to climb the Wollong Bar and I got really grumpy at this rug on the floor because he's tripped on this thing five times. Like that ends retirements. You fall down bust a, a knee and a hip in your 70s. That's not a good outcome. Like, do you love this rug? Hang it on the wall if you like it. And um, you were saying, what, what do they do when they come in for aged care? The first thing they look at? Trip hazards. Because that's what ends people living independently in any of aged care. So, you know, when you're entering retirement in the early years, you're not at that stage, but a few little things that can just help, really help along the way. Uh, and then, Raising the grandkids, so this is a really interesting one I've got. It's the best way to help your kids because it gets them back to work. It's also one of the biggest discussion points. Is that a nice way to put it in our reviews with our clients now, Belinda? Mm -hmm. With him going, I want to go away and she's minding the kids, or he put us down to mind the kids because the kids are like me, they're working every day. 
great week of mine on Monday, Tuesday, Sash will be the same. Right, well, they're the days because I've, I've factored you're doing that. Because if you don't do that, I'm, I don't have a plan B because they're not in daycare, they're not all of this, it's really hard to do that. So that that can be a rod to your back, it can be the best way to help them. It, it's a really tricky one um, in there. So if you're lucky you have those. <laughs> My in-laws are not much help with either one through the way, so we've managed to get by. Um, and maybe because my wife's side were working and my folks were away, I said, just go travel, no matter health issues, go see the world, just, you know, you need to go and do those things. So, will I run out of money? When you get to the back thing, that, that was what ultimately came through. And we do have this spreadsheet I'll run through at the end, and it was built by a client who we went and Josh and I went and saw him the other day and said, we're still using every single presentation with clients to show them that they got enough. And he always laughs, really? I mean, we do because it's a simple Excel spreadsheet, earning an average rate of return, there's nothing hidden. We can change one or two variables and work out how you work out. So residential property as an investment, all right, so it's been very good for growth out there. Having the best blue chip house you can live in worked really well. Um, incomes tend to be a bit low out there. Tenants aren't what they are today than they were 20 years ago. How many people have ripped a shower rail off in their bathroom? How many people have ripped the door handles off in their bathroom? So I remember even back in the 90s working with Dad who was a sparky who ended up being the handyman for all the holiday units around. Back of his thing wasn't full of electrical. I just looked on what Dad did for a while there. It's full of towel rails, door handles, stuff that you and I go, I've never had one fall off in my house. We're replacing 10 of these a day. What the hell are these people doing? So unfortunately, the people you're renting your hard-earned property to aren't necessarily having the same outlook on life as you're having, and that can be an issue um, for people at the time. When I need property, if you can get a property, have a good tenant, sit them there, and even if they're paying under market, and it's Mark Kettle who's been there for 20 years, you and I are like, fantastic, keep them as long as you can. You don't need the extra thousand or two thousand a year. You just need someone not to destroy it once every three or four years, and you're so far in front, it's not funny. Um, unfortunately, we do, we probably get a lot of the train wreck stories come in because they come to us when they've had three or four hours horrendous situation, sold the lot, walk in the door and go on. I'm done with that. Um, whereas if someone's got one out there in a good location and, and it's got a decent agent mining it, it's probably less of an issue out there. Industrial property, I reckon this is almost like the great retirement at the moment. We have had more high net worth people sell large industrial property in the last 12 months than I've ever seen. So we're talking two, three, four, five, up to $10 million properties. Because the income yield is, is getting uh, pushed down, the property value went up, and even they're going, this just makes no sense. I just, if someone's gonna buy this off me and they're that stupid, I'm gonna sell it. Um, and these are people unrelated to us and unrelated to each other coming in that are getting referred in. It's been, that's been a really eye-opening, and I, even I'm like, well, you know commercial property, you got 10, you once you can buy one for two or three, we'll put a couple of mil away, you can earn decent income off both, nice simple return. No, they're like, there's no way of buying it at the moment, it's not even close. So it's interesting how that cycle changes over time. Um, how much risk? So you know, we tend to have our clients in a balanced approach, uh, even those that had a bit more growth, we've been, have been trying the last uh, year or so to get them pulling back just to that more balanced middle of the road approach. Because there, there is negative quarters and we're having those at the moment, we had them with the COVID, we had GFCs, we've had them September 11th. Unfortunately, in your retirement, every, you know, I'll say every five years to six, somewhere in there there's going to be a major event coming, we need to get through those. So, how's our method? Rather than guessing, we try to have between one and three years of cash as a buffer. If you had lots of money, money's not an issue. If three years of cash, fantastic. Really bulletproof retirement. If we've got a juggle return versus cash buffer, we're probably at two, and as a minimum, we'd say one, and if they didn't like one, we'd probably say, you better find someone else, because we don't, you don't need to take that much risk. Um, so having that get through those periods, how do we know? Um, so the head of perpetual multi-asset is a man called Michael O'Day. He 
is a guest on our investment committee for the models that I chair for the license. So we manage about one billion, he probably manages 60. We listen to him, he's the smartest man in the room. Um, and he asked, why do you want a no troll? So I want to know how much cash buffer we need so you never need to sell in a downturn. Well, I want that answer. Perpetual went and paid two math geniuses. Six months later, he walked in with a USB. You can't, have, can't show anyone. I'll leave it in your hands. The answer is 2.2 though. So 2.2 years of cash buffer. So what do we mean by that? If you had a million dollars and you wanted to spend 60 grand a year, multiply 60 by 2.2, have that in cash, whatever the world threw at you, you're gonna be okay. Um, so that was pretty handy data to have. Next step is what we did for clients is we want the portfolios to reweigh each quarter. So that when it market drops, we're buying, when it's going up, we're taking profit. That just reduced risk further. So that's our sort of methodology in the background for getting through these periods. We don't expect you to like downturns, nobody does. Um, but they're a, a part of life, and particularly if people are heading into retirement, we have one of those. That's why we, they can say, oh, that's why the cash buffer, yes. Some clients could be three years in, could be four years in before, you know, they're the ones badgering us going, why the hell have I got this cash you dragged on return on? Yep, you know, next to nothing. But it's there for the periods of the to back in this quarter. It's, it's not there to chase return. That allows the other to earn a return. That's just a method of looking. And that's how you have to deal with volatility, because guess what happens when you retire? You start to look at your super. We'll have people walking the door to us and barely know the name of the super fund, let alone what's invested in. We set up an investment portfolio, because it's on the phone, you know, 342 looks later for a month. They're all over it. They're having a good day, bad day, good day, bad day, depending on that. Guess what? It's going to move. Troy, did you know this is moving? Yeah, mate. Did you know the market's moved the last couple hundred years of, of ever since you know there's been anything of any value daily? Oh, oh. So it's just having that understanding there that just because things are happening, it's not new, it's not scary, but it should, you know, you do need to, to be aware of that. So the part time work of volunteering that, that was interesting because this client, He'd never actually even told us about the volunteering until we caught up the other day and he went, no, no, I just do that for me. That's my, my thing I like to do. So um, there are some Centrelink benefits to it as well, particularly if you're under age 65. And we do a lot of strategies around that. It works well. A bit of volunteering, a bit of give back to the community. Government gives you a bit of money. Uh, there's a bit of a win in there. So Belinda's the whiz of all those strategies. All right, helping the kids. This is the... This is the, another big one that, that in households, I normally tell people go over the bottle of wine and then talk about this one because there'll be differing opinions on how much to help. Day-to-day um, -day cost of after-school care or child mining, is that super expensive, Sash? It can be, yes. Yeah, so we have lots of mums we employ, we know how hard it is when, when wonderful, and I call a school day off, you know, that's our oh, crap in my world. For them it is, how do we juggle? The amount of unsettling that causes just at, at our level, let alone across everywhere. It's, it's amazing, like, who's minding the kids that day? Um, the best thing you can do is save them the childcare cost and allows them to come back to work. As an employer, I love it, I get more days. Um, because they generally come back two days, three days, and then, you know, four days. Uh, and they're pretty hard to get past for what I know, but I can always ask. Um, but that could be a really good help because if they go back to a nearly a double income family, that, that alleviates a lot of pressure, they need to have pressure in their house. They're probably going to hopefully happier marriages because there's less stress. We see couples coming with financial stress, they're stressed, that is not good for a household perspective. So that can be the best help you can give them. Um, the downside is, is once it's given, it's relied upon. So, um, I just tell your parents because they're clients as well. Yeah, that's, that's the commitment we all share. Um, you want to go away? Really? I just think it's a bad idea. Um, because they've, they've got to fill out short term boards. So just bear that in mind. Um, the other one's helping kids, but the cost of housing is huge. It's super expensive. It's hard to get in. Um, and how do we do it? A couple of things we do. Some clients, we've got uh, endowment policies to help um, for actually. Uh, paying for when kids turn a certain age and that matures, so it's a good way to get money to the next generation. Um, there's a group yesterday doing education ones where you can actually put the money in, pull the money out per annum 
to cover the education cost. Um, so that's another flexibility to it. Guarantor land or deposit. How many minutes do I give you? Do you, do you want to do the quick version? Um, yes. You okay, don't, don't do any of it. Yeah, well, the hard thing, the hard thing is that as a guarantor, once you're in, you can't get out. Um, that's probably the worst part about it. Lending, it has to be a commercial loan, otherwise it'll be treated as an asset. But really where the problems all arise is if there's a bust up with you, with your kids' relationship. Most people don't mind losing a bit of money on their own kids, but they, they resent it a lot if it's someone else. Um, so in a family law context, if you've lent the couple money for a deposit. A lot of the time the, the court would treat it as though it was a gift anyway. Um, and the other thing is that if you're lending money for a deposit, a lot of the time the financier, the actual, the bank financier will want you to sign something to say that it was a gift, that you're not going to ask for it to come back. And it's pretty hard to go to court saying, I'm suing to get my money back, that I actually said was a gift to defraud the bank. Um, so it's just not a good look and puts you in a very bad situation. So, um, so realistically, doing it, you got to do it on the basis that uh, whatever, whatever you're doing, try not to think about it anymore because it'll only uh, because if you come to it, came to see me, there'd be no safe way of doing it. It's probably about the only way that you could do it safely. I think would be to actually have a have an interest in the home itself, um, and then that way at least your capital's going to. Preserved, assuming that the first mortgage doesn't eat it all up. Yeah, if there was a downturn, downturn in the property market, which does tend to happen on the Gold Coast from time to time. So, so. Oh, thank you. So, we can ask that one a lot. I always go as legal because unfortunately we see what happens when the clients ring down the track when there's a divorce, when there's a separation, when there's a business issue. And that, that might mean anything they do, but Condev's a great example of your son in law's the tradie and he just did all work for Condev and didn't get paid in the last two months. He's got a dirty, great big bill, there's a problem. That problem becomes your problem, becomes a bigger problem. So, and then I go, do people set it up? Great, it's a P problem. So, <coughs> uh, that's why you need to have good people around you to make sure they can sort uh, Intergenerational estate planning. So, we do, we've sort of written a bit of a paper. Part of it, Peter's ideas on those as well. Um, we can help with that structuring. How do we do that? So transferring assets to that next generation. There's, there's clever methods in conjunction with your accountant, with trusts and uh, companies and things that you can actually do to uh, hopefully alleviate some of the tax with that. Uh, we're working with some family groups to create like a family office, their own investment committee, and and helping chair that. Some work functionally. Some start arguments, um, got a big farming community where ultimately if you're the matriarchs of the family you, you need to control it and they tried to set up the meeting and oh we don't need any outside and then all of the kids all got together and thought they'll overthrow mum and dad for ideas and all hell's broken loose. Uh, you've just, you've got to have a controlled method of here's what we're trying to do. We're trying to build wealth for the family, we are controlling it and we're teaching the kids so that ultimately we have a large uh, pool of money that will last intergenerationally done poorly. Everyone getting in the room with great intentions can end up a nightmare and probably ends up in Peter's door to solve the problem. Um, done properly can work really well. Done the other way can uh, can have the opposite effect, and that's not what anyone wants. Um, what about your wishes? So we get this a lot of how much will it cost to get a will? How much will that do? Your house is probably worth a million bucks. Super's worth maybe 500 million bucks, a couple of million bucks, I don't know. What's a well cost per part, Pete? Uh, just a standard, probably. If you're doing a pair at a time, um, you know, it could be 1,200 bucks. Yeah. Um, and then you'd normally do your enduring powers of attorney at the same time, and we, you, you virtually throw them in, there'd be a couple of hundred dollars in those. So 1,500 bucks, I didn't know Pete was coming, so I looked well. That's what I'll do tonight, unless you want to come back again at six. And he laughs. Um, my point is, assets, cost, it just needs to be done properly. 
the other scenario that, um, and I'll get to it in the next one actually on, on there, so I'll leave that to another slide. But um, the other one's the power of attorney. So Belinda gets this, she has a lot of clients, she helps with aged care. So something happens, go 20 years down the track and you fall off your ladder. And then nobody's got any ability to sign anything because we have no power of attorney and you're all sitting in a hospital somewhere and all hell breaks loose. And then you're asking an independent person outside your house that has to make decisions quickly and on everlasting. Does that scare you people when people are doing that? The doctor has got lots of assets, I bet he's going, oh, I don't really want to do this. So there's just there's common sense reasons why you should have these. Um, they are important. Hopefully you never need the damn things. But when you need them, and when they don't have capacity, and I've got a client I've looked after for nearly 20 years who unfortunately Belinda's helping into aged care at the moment. And little by little, she's getting a little bit forgetful. Thankfully, I'm picking up the kid, but that was a good one. Because we sent her over and you fix that, even though she told me it was right, and when you haven't done it, I know you haven't, go fix it. Now she doesn't have capacity. So at least we know the daughter's taking over. You know, there's a bit of, there's always argy-bargy in the background, ex-husbands and all sorts of things. So thankfully we have the daughter there taking over, stepping, control of money. Hopefully we get a good outcome. Uh, they're the hardest part with the power of attorney though, you are giving that person the burden to make the decision. So, so we sort of have to have that deal of when does somebody go into care and, and how do you make those decisions. And a lot of you sitting here are going to have to make that for your parents. Um, so we've been through it with you <laughs> for your parents. So once you've been through it with your parents and they don't have the paper because they're the generation who want to pay for the wills and everything else, you realise just how bad it is because you've got to, You've got private health that stops paying once it's an aged care problem. You've got an aged care facility that goes, who's got authority to admit this person? And someone's in a hospital bed unwell. Not a good scenario. That's, that's pretty much what stresses Belinda's team out quite a bit. Because she's got to find a solution to all those problems. Pete, we've got to find someone to tie like QCAT. Together. QCAT, yeah. We've got a magic bit of paper, really simple, sat in the drawer. That would be really good. Um, what if your funds end up breaking a marriage up? I've seen that, so that's why it is important. You know, marriage has been a bit rocky, someone passes, money comes into the household, you know what? They're sitting there going, oh, that $5 million plus our house, four million, two and a half each, yeah, I can live with that, I'm off. And we've seen that happen uh, as well. So that's why having those, you know, entities and things done in testamentary trusts and things and wills can be important because you can have the opposite effect to what you had hoped. Um, they, they, they're not all tragic stories. If we can avoid the tragics and like good ones, then I don't have any bad stories, it'd be great. But they do walk in the door. Um, and estate planning, that was the cost versus the, the cost of not. This is the other one, leaving money directly to the kids. It could be business issues. So we haven't had those issues. Economy's been going pretty well. You look at this scenario, you know, all over the bully. How many tradings don't get paid? How many suppliers aren't going to get paid? And this is the first of what could be many because these things tend to have a ripple effect. And if one big building company's got a problem, chances are quite a few of the others have too. So just be wary of those scenarios in the background there. Another one, yeah, got a will. Yeah, yeah, did the will kit, got you know, Bill and Mary out of the fence, signed it, didn't have to pay those lawyers. Fantastic, where is it? That's in the dresser drawer. You tell anyone where it is? Oh God, no, I wouldn't tell anyone that, Troy. They know where it is. Well, any chance the kids would come in, second-hand furniture place, takes all the stuff, will's gone? Yeah, it happens. Worst one I've ever seen personally was a large farming family, someone written out, no one was having copy, he was keeping a copy in the safe, in their retirement village, the son who was written out specifically for a reason, would go to a wait, turn up, and there is a stain on the carpet, really clean. He just took the whole safe. Went to court, the court went, well, here's what's in here. Sworn statements, I've seen the well. Well, they're really that concerned. It would have all been everywhere. Quarter, 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 bang, next case, he double dipped. So it can happen really easily by, we didn't bother a having copies somewhere, or having them somewhere where they should be. Because when you do a will with someone, and there was one in Palm Beach who did a ton who retired, and then they're meant to be kept in copies everywhere, but back in the day, 
back in the 90s or whatever. I suggest there may have occasionally been cost cutting, not by lawyers out there, but uh, when it came to getting copies of these wills, the copies that were going to be stored everywhere suddenly weren't there. Um, because these things can live for a long period of time. So just the simple bit of where is it, who's got a copy of it, we scan, take copies uh, in there just so at least we've got something in that regard. The other one people forget about is entity. Super funds and companies, you've got will all sorted. Um, out of a company or an entity, and that's a totally different beast to your will. So you've just got to have that all factored in. So we do like accountants and lawyers to have the same page, same outcome to make sure something's worked for them. Uh, decisions for you, that's around that power of attorney um, there. Um, if you go to aged care, you would ring Belinda and she would fix it, that's my answer. Um, but from an estate planning perspective, it's just making sure those are events nobody wants to have happen. Okay. So any of you that are dealing with mums or dads going into those scenarios, you will realise how hard a scenario it is. There's enough emotional stress alone not having paperwork there and once someone doesn't have capacity, they don't have capacity. You have a major problem and you don't want to be dealing with a public trustee. All right, these are in your packs. So this was sitting out to a number of clients who are retired. I was just going to read a couple of notes that you to read them all. Um, and there was a common theme, we had more, but we had them kept coming in even as we were presenting here. The main theme, your biggest concern, if you're sitting there thinking and worrying about running out of money, it's pretty much across the board. That's an absolutely normal thought. The, the interesting thing I want to highlight is how much does your lifestyle cost? Because our second question with clients is, yeah, what assets have we got? What income do we need in retirement? And how we get done up? All right, we've got people that spend 30 grand, 40 grand, 100 grand. 250 grand, everything in between. Um, it's when people are spending 100 grand, tell us they only need 50 grand and have enough to only generate 50 grand. Um, yeah. Brooke and I had one of those Zoom calls a couple of days ago. Oh, I mean, you know, we've had this chat with you 12 months ago and I've had a chat with you 12 months before. You need to change your spending habits where you are going to run out of money. It is your money, you can spend it if you want, but I'm telling you, that's what's happening. Oh, you know, Troy, we're used to this, but they got into bad habits. They got this bad habit of paying for everything for the kids and all this sort of stuff. It's like, if you've got five million bucks, knock your socks off. But if you've got 600 grand and you're trying to run your house and the kids and everything there, you're going to have a problem. And it's going to be a problem for the rest of your life and it's not getting better. So avoiding the bad habits um, was probably the key in there. Age pension, um, $25,155 for a single is probably something I did this thing on my phone. Actually, um, that changed in three days. There you go, in three days, I, I did off my app. Uh, a couple was 37,923, so there is a safety net in the age pension. Um, to get full pension, single is under 270,000 in assets, couple 405, couple cuts out at 891. We have lots of couples that, as they're going through retirement, things are going well, that they lose a partner and then they've got to deal with a totally raging financial situation. It's really cruel, that, um, because it massively, we're well, going through enough. Uh, you know, no, the government needs to go, look, we just, there should be an amnesty for a period because that's just yeah, extremely cruel and having to redo that because what was enough assets and income across two, across one, suddenly could not be. Uh, what stopped you retiring earlier? And Al will probably say, Troy said I wasn't allowed. That's right. Which I did. Yeah. Why not another six months? I can keep dragging that old yeah. that chestnut out for years. It's fantastic. Um, but if people couldn't afford to retire. They were either reluctant to finish work. I really like this one. I don't know who wrote it. I need to find the original. But if you keep looking back, it's likely you were not ready to retire. Be clear and honest with yourself that you have something meaningful to do when you retire. I read that one. Clients are smart with that. It's gold. Because um, they've obviously given it a lot of thought. Because a lot of clients we do spend a lot of years talking about retirement and the day they walk in and go down. Um, the other one I do sit down with them is while those other things are important, you don't want to go, yep, yeah, you know, engineers, my brother's an engineer, it's not their fault, but there's one in the room. Um, <laughs> Because if you told them they have to get to one million dollars to earn sixty thousand a year, they'll get to that walk and they're yep, Troy slapping on the table. I'm done. Let's retire. 
that's what they said. And then the next question is, what are you going to do? Well, he wanted a boat, a van, a car, and oh, hang on, that's, that was to generate the money. You've now got some lifestyle toys, they needed to add on top uh, on there. So you want to factor those in advance, that's why starting with the van and all that, that's important. You don't want to suddenly need a $180,000 motorhome that you didn't tell anyone. It was in this little bubble that we never quite got to speaking about. So that's why they're important. That's why, you know, you say to people, what would six more months work do? They don't want to work six more months. The six more months is, what would that give them? That gives them the new car, gives them the home, it gives, gives them the motor home, it gives them something. Right, they're ticked off, now we're okay. We know we're okay. Um, what did you wish you knew before you retired? In there, a couple of points. One of them coming through for a lot was the lifestyle cost out there. So, was it really cost to live? We don't tell people to do budgets because I don't believe they're going to tell me the truth. What I ask them to do is add up what they spent the last six or 12 months and there's a good starting point. Add up your credit cards, work out what you spend in cash, guess what, there's your, there's your answer. Strip out one-off costs, there's a real answer we can work with, um, as opposed to a, a guesstimate that's well-intentioned but maybe short. Um, one of my clients' best tips was one job a day. Try to do one job a day. Don't do your week's worth of jobs in the week, you'll be bored in one day. So, I'm sorting the pool tomorrow, I do that. If I've done by 10, fantastic. I'm still going at three, oh well. It's a really good routine that he, that he got himself into uh, out there. So it's just finding something that works for you. Um, circle of friends with hobbies, interests, pride and retirement. That can be a tough one because everyone retires at different ages, different stages um, and different ideas as well. So that can be a tough one to do, but uh, yeah, the, the main tip there really is avoid those bad spending habits. So, uh, you know, one client, she wants to go out all the time, catch up with friends. Money-wise, you're going, oh, you're spending about 15 grand more than, I don't know where it's going, I know the lifestyle you have. And it's dinners two or three nights a week that suddenly add up. I'm like, well, you don't have to not have the social interaction, but go for coffee. Like, coffee, five or 10 bucks. 100 bucks, three times a week. Three times a week times 52 weeks of the year, it's 15 grand a year. That's where the money went. Do you love dinner that much? Oh no, it's a social interaction, great. Why do you think blokes ride bikes? It's not for riding a bike. It's for the coffee and the catch up afterwards. That's their scenario. I just couldn't see myself in the like of myself. Uh, and the other one, shiny new toys. So from that perspective, business clients are the biggest uh, with those, they used to, yep, yeah, four years, new truck trader, and get another one. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. We have one client like that, and just shaking my head. I'm like, we've had this chat. It's like your capital is dwindling because you're buying the shiny new car that's got 10,000 Ks on it, and you're trading in every three years. Like, I don't think it's worn out. I don't think Mr. Toyota, Lexus, or BMW built a car to do 10,000 Ks or 20 of it worn out. So, works great in your working life, but not so much in, in retirement. So I've got sort of five points for you to do at your leisure to rate yourself on. Um, if you can answer those, you're a fair way in your range. Don't do them for me, it's your retirement, not for mine. If you want to bring them back to the next meeting, you can. Um, that one, we can run some numbers, out there in your capital. Uh, quite a few clients are sending their kids in, we're happy to do that. It's part of the service we do as well. We kids buy houses, do cash flow, do conversation, we can help them on their way uh, with that. Uh, power of attorney, we send them to a trained professional uh, out there, and then he can run through those points and I can be the good guy, not the bad guy. If, if you've sat in a room with me, you've definitely seen this, which is how long it'll last. This is what's built by a client. We can do it in numbers or graphs, uh, but it simply shows you've got a million bucks spent, 60 grand a year, CPI from inflation, bottom pink line is earning 5%, top one's averaging eight. What would the money look like? I guarantee you, you will not get a straight line in retirement. We've just got to get that average rate of return. How do we do it? Plus 15, minus two, plus seven. If we've had a number of more stable years. We're having a, a negative quarter at the moment. That was a snapshot I pinched before last month uh, in there. So down 4.7 for three months. What does that mean in our portfolio? At the end of December, we sold to a profit. 
end of March, we're going to buy something back at a four and a half to five percent discount from what it was before. As long as we're getting the average, 12 month lead month was still seven, three years was 11, five, 9.94. And we, we normally tell people to aim for six. If we aim for six percent over time, we've got one client who retired pre um, GFC, and he actually takes more than that because it was 6,000. I've always told this for the last 10 years, it was five, but it's always 60, snuck it up there in those early months. And um, it's about 1.4 at the moment. He never changes it. It's just, never a conversation. She's got other money. That's just, that's my spending money, Troy. So over time, there's ups and downs and everything, but it's just having a method to get through those. In your packs, some of you have been through this one with me, 20 questions. I think there should be three people in the back row there that have been through this one recently in there. If we said to create a bucket list, um, we, we have had uh, Keith present, so we do um, some other material we use. It just asks different questions on things you'd like to do. What, what would I like to go and see? Um, wonders of the world I'd like to experience, health milestones. If you can get a, a number of things in those areas, there's your starting point for your roadmap. Just a, a really simple tool, with one of those in there. Intergenerational wealth, that's more the nitty gritty when we work out with the, um, with the lawyers. We're a little brochures on product, no, just why do we manage money the way we do around that. I don't think we included those, but they yeah, okay. we're still a little bit of Rabino, we printed those because we're kind of less than mine. Wills is a real person to talk to in the audience um, on that. But I suppose, yeah, all I wanted to, to make sure with this session was it's just not about the numbers. We can, we can do some numbers and spreadsheets for that. It's all of those other scenarios. That's what's going to be whether you have a happy retirement or an unhappy retirement. And the grey separation or the grey divorce is a real thing. And we have seen that increase too in the last few years. So that's, you want to avoid that one. That's a very expensive scenario. Um, nobody wants that. Any other questions other than that? I think some people need to go. I'm here, you can hang around for Q&A. Other than that, thank you for coming. We. We'll try some different topics, COVID permitting. I oh, yeah, with COVID, it's fair enough. Um, so we'll try some other topics. Things you want to come to, come along uh, from time to time. We'll just try to find some interesting different topics to hopefully bring, generally we bring an expert in, but I think we see, see more retiree than anyone. So um, we did that one ourselves. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.